Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 334 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. Very special tracksuit edition featuring my good friend Greeley. Welcome back to the show. Hey! Welcome back. Well, it's fucking good to be back, mate. Yes. Oh, the old Spearhead Sundays. Yes. It's been a while. Fan favourite guest. Oh, yeah. This is the tracksuit edition of the show. Yeah, mate. Um, and this, this might be the first um, episode of the podcast I've ever done where me looking side on at the guest i actually have a chin visible mm, which mm. is pretty good yeah fuck yeah you showed me some you showed me some before and after photos but it didn't have a silhouette you have yeah. to have a like of what your silhouette like with the shadow on the background what yeah. it looks like yeah yeah one of those old time timey photos yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now just with a nice protruding chin yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh bro it's fucking wonderful to be here man you've come so far on your journey over the last couple of years just yeah. in life, bro. For, I think back to when we did the tour together and, you know, us, well, you're not being really aware of how unhealthy you were. Um, yeah, that, that tour, the Independent Variable Tour, was my, was my fourth tour and probably that was when uh, I started to become quite sick and mm. I just had no idea. I just no. thought, oh, I'm becoming more successful. I'm, I'm working tired. hard, so of course I'm going to be a bit more tired. Yeah. And that was when it was like, in my head at least, a reasonable level of exhausted. Mm. But that, but it just never went away and it just yeah. got worse. And yeah, even just your like, the energy in your face that you carry yeah. now, it's different, bro. Mm. It's really different. So it's like, yeah, what a journey, my bro. I'm so proud of you for getting through it all. It's a lot of fucking, so many different shifts you went through in regards to just not only your personal growth, your health growth, your physical growth, everything, man. Yeah, yeah, it's, been, and, it's and been a very big journey. It has, man. And, like, for myself as well, when I think back to, you know, our connection and also the time on this podcast, like, from when, fuck, the first podcast you and I did, we were mm. recording it on a phone in a car in a housing commission area in Tasmania. <laughs> fuck, that's true. Was that even filmed or was just, it nah, was just audio? It was just audio. We recorded it on your phone and we sat in the car because we were like, oh, it'll be dead. There's a good booth sitting yeah, in the car. Yeah. It's the best we had was just using someone else's car as a fucking podca podcast booth. Yeah, that's know? right. Man, I forgot that we did that. That's so... Yeah, yeah this, pod this podcast has come a long way. It has. Like, every time you and me do an episode together, both of us have changed a lot. Mm. Uh, sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. Yeah, but um, it all had to get worse for it to get better, man. And yeah, I think 100%. That's... It's like when, like, talking about that tour that you and I did, that was probably when it, right before it kind of got quite bad for the two of us, mm. you ended up in prison, yeah. I ended up uh, in uh, in lockdowns and, and uh, going through my own health stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, and and now the the pods that we've done since has been like kind of coming out of that and oh, growing really from has. that. Yeah, man, it really has. In so many different ways. Yeah. So yeah, man, it's exciting. It like, is. And this is like the next level. This yeah. Is, this is like I feel like we've both recalibrated ourselves in different ways. Yeah. We've both realigned with our kind of purpose of what we're doing. And yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, we talk about again. this all the time of like how all the stuff that we've like. <clears throat> endured and grown from and mm. been through has really just kind of i feel i feel like for me that this is the first time in a really long time where i'm like oh my god i actually can kind of see five years in the future and i can kind yeah. of have a vague plan to work towards with that whereas before when i was sick and lockdowns and like kind of bullshit i was like oh man if i can get to next week that'd be awesome yeah bro yeah same here man like especially the last year of my life has really been a big journey for me and to be back here coincidentally at this time i'm living in melbourne at the moment yeah i've been making music again i've been doing battles i've been doing everything that i've always done but for different reasons like mm. it's been 14 years since i first came to melbourne to do a rap battle um you know i lived in melbourne signed to a record label i've done all the things yeah and thought i was doing all the things right but it never worked out well Mm. It always ended up somehow with me feeling fucked over or something going wrong. Mm. Whereas now I'm, I'm moving for a different energy and moving. F I, I'm not results driven. Yeah. I'm like, it's, it's interesting. I've just changed, I guess, the laws of attraction mm. around how I'm moving. And now it's all just coming towards me in the best of ways, man. And yeah. I just see you're in a very similar position, bro. Like, both of us have really spent a lot of years not only 
building ourselves, but building people around us. You know, I know that f- through what I did through the hip hop culture, you really admired, and I watched you do it through the comedy culture as mm. well. We're both movers and shakers like that. We both also, um, we like the grand scheme of things. We like to build up people around us. Yes. Which has, yeah. you know, sometimes worked well for us, sometimes it's worked against us. Mm. Um, but yeah, to be where we're at right now, to know where you're at, to know where I'm at, and just to be back here, man, it's a fucking honor. It's a blessing. It's such yeah. a celebration in every way. So yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's good. It's, I think, like, um, I think the the longer you work in entertainment, especially, you can kind of get sucked into two different paths, which is like money and numbers online mm. or sales, uh, or like just creating to become a better artist and a more honest mm. artist and become like much much better at the craft and and that's kind of I feel like everyone starts off just being like money fans mm. this and that. And then the the love of the actual art form itself can kind of get lost oh, 100%. in that. And then you see a lot of people burn out or crash yeah. and burn, and then they get more excited by drugs and alcohol than they do money or fame or mm. the the art itself. But like what I've kind of what I've kind of really really understood is that money and fans is actually just kind of like a byproduct and a side effect of being a really good artist. Yeah, and that's always what you should what you should be chasing 100 percent, man that, that's exactly it yeah i've lived a life where you know i was living for the next gig mm. you know i was gigging as a way of making ends meet and yeah that took the love right out of that you yeah. know and for me it's like really getting back to just doing what i love and i don't care about the rest as long as if, I, if i've got enough to survive the rest of it's pointless for me you yes know? and i think yeah, we're at an interesting time in the world where we can see a lot of shit for how it is. And I think finding your finding your happy place during this chaos is the most important thing. Yeah. Wherever that happy place may be. Um, we're so, once again, lucky and blessed to be where we're at. Mm. And we need to make the most of it and give love to the world every day through doing what we do, you know? Yeah. And, like, I think our creative element... Not only as we share sincerely with people and try and... The, the most important thing in this time of living is empowering, I think. Yeah. Is empowering, you know, the right people. It's very interesting, bro. Yeah, you. it's like empowering yourself uh, and then pointing other people in the correct direction mm. rather than trying to... And this can be this like relationships as well. Like yeah. you can't fix your girlfriend, you can't fix your boyfriend. Yeah. You can point them in the right direction mm. and give them access to resources and assist them in healing themselves. And that's yeah. the, the the same thing is true of, of of everything. It's like yeah, it's you need to figure out how to empower yourself and kind of use that to uh, after you've empowered yourself, which is a really that takes a long time in mm. figuring yourself out and figuring out your own health. I mean, I only just became healthy three weeks ago when I got my braces off for the mm. first time in my life. I'm 30 and yeah. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm fucking here. Mm. Uh, and it's, and, and now I've noticed so many people around me, people that I know personally, but then also after all these Melbourne shows, so many people are coming up to me and being like, man, I've started taking my health seriously. I've started actually going to doctors and chasing this shit up or man, I had no idea that I had horrible sleep apnea. Mm. That's why I was, that's why I'm depressed. That's why I'm fatigued. And that's why I feel like shit. That's why I'm fat. That's why I can't put on weight because mm. I'm not sleeping properly. And it's like, oh yeah, there's no way I could have fixed that for these people. But me kind of sharing my own journey and being honest about the struggles of it and, and keeping people updated on the process. I've actually inspired a fuckload of people to f- resolve that, the specific, the same issue that I had that they had no idea that they had, but then also other people being like, oh man, I had this completely other unrelated yeah, thing and I saw you go through all that years of fixing your thing and coming out the other end, it's inspired me to actually take control and mm. try and fix this other thing that I had. Yeah, man. It's about looking inwards mm. and like all self work, whether it be like, you know, physical health, whether it be mental health or spiritual health. Yeah. It's all about looking inwards. And yeah, we get, we're in an external world mm. where everything is given to us externally. 
you know, everything that's marketed to us. Pretty much a lot of humans are just byproducts of marketing. Really, yeah. you know, yeah. and we're so deep in that psyche of it that it's very hard to break free from it. Well, I think like it's just like the first thing that most people do the second they wake up is they they reach for their phone because that's mm. their alarm and then they turn the alarm off and now they're on social media and it's just like other people's thoughts and agendas yeah. going straight into your fucking brain before you've even had a chance to realise that you're human and alive. Yeah, fucking <laughs> It's nice. like you just wake up and you're like, what do other people think? That's what I'm going to absorb. Yeah, yeah. Gonna... And then, and then you know, you open up your phone, you're scrolling, you're like, fuck, I just watched six people die. Ah, oh, it's yeah. Monday. I have to go to work? Oh, it's full <laughs> on, man. It's very full on. Yeah, so interesting, bro. Yeah, I just got back from um, Tassie. I was yeah. went down and did the In the Hood tour with Spanion. Yes. Which this was... has been going crazy yeah. all over social media. Um, if you don't know who Spanion is, uh, he's like a guy who kind of uh, blew up online by uh, just talking about his crim past yeah. on Instagram, uh, doing things called hood talks and mm. hood knowledge and just talking about all the crimes that he personally committed, what he learned from it, uh, without being remorseful about it or shying from it he was just exceedingly honest mm. he kind of blew up and of course this happens in australia he blew up everyone fucking hated him mm. and then he kept doing it now everyone then he became successful and now people are like actually we really like him yeah. and he runs a very su successful youtube channel now it's because australia is still just a bunch of convicts that are lying to themselves this yeah. is what i see that whole reflection of like hey we don't like this yep. as like a reflection of the deep subconscious that is the criminal beginning of what Australia is. Yeah. And they're like, hey, this is triggering. But then once they get past their trigger, they're like, yeah, we actually like him because we're... we're, we're yeah, we have, it's, it's a horrible cultural cringe that we have in Australia. And it's every, it's every single type of... Um, it's everything. Like yeah. anyone who becomes successful in, any, in anything uh, in this country kind of goes through a pretty big period of hate from fellow Australians oh, so true. until they start to kind of make it and then it, they're like begrudgingly accepted but they're not fully, fully accepted until Americans really like them and you know, it, and then they get embraced. It's it's a really interesting thing. Uh, so it's, that's like so I remember when I, it's, it happened with Australian rap, the genre, yeah. now it's quite accepted mm. because uh, uh, like you've got people like 1-4 and big drill rappers that are blowing up in the States mm. and in the UK. So it's now it's not lame and it's not cringe. Yeah. And now it's an accepted part of culture. Um, it happened with, with me when I first started in 2012. Me and all of the other online comics were railed against by traditional comedians but then also a lot of people were like like i remember having a youtube channel when i started one was like fucking lame and how dare you oh, start yeah. one now everyone's got a tiktok yeah, and and uh a bunch of like these uh comics you know myself included have blown up internationally yeah, and man. now it's very accepted and it it's a really interesting thing that is um feels fairly unique to australian culture that um, I see talked about all the time on TikTok as well. Yeah, from oh, foreigners. Yeah, 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 which is fascinating. They know we do it. It's so it's because it's fuck, man. Uh, Australia's got such an ego issue. It's like I did this yeah. like cipher not long ago, and there was a guy on there. He was a white Australian. He's like he did the whole Oz accents the best, and yeah. it just like knowing what I know now and having the experience I've got across all of Australia. I was like, what do you mean Oz accent? Mm. What is an Oz accent? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, are you talking about the handed down sixth generation convict English accent? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what is the Oz accent? Mm. And how the fuck do you think it's the best? Yeah. What do you mean the best? The best is subjective. Yeah. How is these fucking people on an isolated large bit of desert yeah. at the bottom of the world? Our accents are the best. Like... It's, just, it's it's super sub subjective. Like yeah. when, like when I walk around here and I talk the way that I talk, no, what doesn't turn any heads. Yeah. No one thinks that I'm sexy for speaking. But when I was in New York, mm. I would speak, and people would be like, "This guy's cool. He's interesting. Wow, mm. it's different. I want to know more about." I'm the same person, oh, maybe but you're that's in a different accents, the environment. Best New York reckons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, it's <laughs> such a it is such a funny thing like i've i've seen i see a lot on tiktok just like um uh international travelers that come to australia will talk about 
they'll be like, oh, I've noticed this. And, and, and they explain all of these things that they've never experienced before. And I'm watching it going, oh yeah, that's like, that's tall poppy syndrome in Australia of like, you know, the, the tallest nail gets hit down, yeah. all that kind of shit. That's very, very uh, natural and normal in this country. But mm. other people come over and it's weird. Like when I went to the States, uh, I had the like several of the weirdest conversations ever with Americans I've never met. And the conversations were, what, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, what's your dream? And I go, oh, I want to do this. And they go, wow, that's so cool. Mm. I could see you doing that. Here's my crazy dream that's ridiculous and impossible. I'm yeah. going to try and do this. I'm going, fuck, I've never had these conversations in Australia of, yeah. like, people sharing their dreams and then going, I believe you can do it mm. and here's what I want to do. Mm. It's it's really interesting that that yeah, man. There's, there's, like, this whole thing in Australia of, like, oh, you want to you wanna be something so you think you're better than me? Mm. No. I wasn't even really thinking about you when I yeah, decided yeah, yeah. I wanted to be... Yeah. A comedian or, or a painter or there's whatever a, the fuck. It's such a like a bit of an ego driven kind of perspective, eh? I really learnt from my time in America as a teenager, all this sort of stuff. Because I grew up in Tassie, A lot of people don't is, know this about Greeley, but you're an American. Yeah, I was born in America and I went yeah. back and forth a bunch of times growing up. And so yeah, I got to do a bit of high school in America and that really taught me um just a lot about the attitude. And yeah, you know, like in Tassie, when I was doing hip hop, everyone would laugh at me and point point at me, and, mm. you know, what a dickhead, you know what I mean? And then uh, at school in America, as soon as they found out that I could beatbox and I was doing it, they like, show us, yeah, show us, come be a part of it. Isn't that you weird? Know? And yeah, then they they convinced me to start rap. I did my first ever rap I did was at school in Texas, so they were wow. like, only beatbox, and they're like, no, you can rap, you know what I mean? They empowered yeah. me. And then I started rapping. Then I got back into to Tasmania where everyone was like, you can't rap. You know what I mean? So, yeah, like, literally yeah. the guys at school in America were like, you can do this. And then I got back home to Kingston High, Tasmania, and they were like, fucking dickhead. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I remember in yeah. year 12 in high school, <coughs> I had just, I think it was the second half of year, of 2012, I just, just started making stuff on Facebook and YouTube. Mm. Um, Facebook there was, days. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Fucking Facebook and Facebook, that's when I started. But I was anonymous at the time until I finished high school. But I remember there was this other kid who started a YouTube channel, just gaming videos, like nothing special, just like having fun with his brother playing Mario Kart. Mm. And people found out about it. And uh, me and my friend group, I found out about it and I would watch them and I'd go, oh, this is cool. Mm. Um, and then uh, I kind of told him, I think this is cool. I've, I've seen it. And he was like really weirded out that people found out about it. Mm. But then the rest of the school found out about it. I told him it was cool. They bullied him. Yeah. He deleted it within a week. Wow. And uh, Bless him. that could have been the next PewDiePie. It was 2012. Yeah, true. Do you know what I mean? Like he was yeah. early, early, early. Mm. I didn't even know you could record gameplay. He yeah. was doing it. Australians bullied him out of it. And it's a it's a fascinating thing. But then there's like there's it like talking about the American ones not all good because they kind of have the opposite problem to us where it's like, oh, you don't want to be exemplary? What are you, a fucking loser? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're poor? That's your fault. Yeah, oh, yeah. you're homeless? You should just be rich instead. Mm. You know, everyone can do it. There's that's like the that's the opposite end yeah, of it's like toxic positivity. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like we have, oh, you wanna be you want to be a rich, successful person? You think you're better than me? And and then other people in, in the States are like, oh, you don't want to be rich and successful? You must mm. be a fucking loser. It's yeah. like the opposite. It's crazy. There's yeah. positives and negatives to both. It's very interesting, man. Because, yeah, especially after this time with Spaniard down in Tassie, I've copped heaps of hate. I'm copping more hate than I've ever copped in years. Well, tell, tell us what happened. So, so Spaniard has a video series on his YouTube channel where he, Into the Hood, where into he, the hood. he does walking tours of dangerous, uh, yeah. e like scary hoods he go, he goes to the around the world. Spots, you yeah. know, he goes to the notorious spots around the world. He's done all of Europe. Yeah. He's done some crazy ghettos in Greece, you know, all sorts of things Oh, the like ones that. in Europe are scary as fuck. Yeah. Like just people just doing heroin in the street. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He's walking past robberies and Straight stuff up. like that. And Man, like this, yeah, this country doesn't realise how good as it is. You know, I've got my Greek friend Stavros. He's like, bro, yeah. why everyone complain here, bro? Yeah. Because he grew up in the, the fucking hood in Athens with that shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's so much more violent, so much more extreme. You know? Yes. Spanion hit me up and he wanted to come down to Tassie and do his In the Hood tour. I want to do one in Frankston with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be amazing. Man. Yeah. It'd be, yeah, very good. 
Mm, and um, so, yeah, he wanted to go to Glenorchy, Bridgewater, and Gagebrook. And he hit me up, and he hit up another rapper that lives in Glenorchy, uh, Wombat, and told us to keep it quiet. Mm. And so we kept it pretty quiet. You know, I hit up one local fella from one of the areas because mm. uh, he's not only also a rapper that's a part of THC, which is the hip-hop platform. That the I've Tassie founded. Hip-Hop Collective. Yeah, Tassie Hip-Hop Collective. And, yeah. you know that I've, yeah, helped push on YouTube and really really try and empower local artists in Tassie. But he's also from the area. He's had a life that represents the area. You know, he grew up in those... He's, a vi- you know, a product of his environment. Mm. And so that was the only kind of person I reached out to. But Tassie is so small. People don't <laughs> understand how small Tassie is, yeah. how interconnected it is, especially when it comes to Snapchat, Instagram, things like that, you know. Tassie's and just one group chat. It really is one big group chat. That's yeah. a good way to put it, you yeah. know. Um, so not only because I, I lived there for a little bit, and mm. I could not believe how many people I kept seeing like multiple times a week. Oh yeah, yeah. I would bump into a into a stranger, and then I would learn their name. Like the guy who cut my hair. Yeah, I I got a, cut my hair in Melbourne. I would never see him ever again in my fucking life mm. unless I went to his barber shop and booked him by name. Yeah. But in Tassie, I got my hair cut once, and then I saw him about four times. Yeah, you go to the shop. The, there the he is getting dinner. He's just there. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I meet a fan. They lose their mind, and then I see them two days later. They lose their mind again, and then I see them next week. Hey, mate. Hey, mate. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> then know? it just comes normal. And then you just see them all the time. It's a group chat. You're it just is, in there man. all the time and chatting to people. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing being like, for me, like I'm a well-known person in Tassie, yeah. and I have been for a while. And it's interesting because, because people are that close, they have to see you on that normal level. Yes. And the whole idea of being like... The mystique goes away. Yeah, yeah, the celebrity thing. It's like, oh, oh, wow, look, at there he is. And then they realise you're just a fucking normal person like everyone is. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I don't know why people look... And then the tall poppy syndrome kicks in. Like, oh, he's just another person. He gets... Yeah, I don't know why people like him. He's just another guy. It's like, yeah, dude. And so is every other... There's nothing special about any of them other than... They they happen to be particularly good at the skill exactly. that they release, and it's, then everything else is just like smoke and mirrors and mystique that often isn't is completely out of the famous person's control. Oh, exactly, man. And as soon as well, like we did the tour on the Saturday, the In yeah. the Hood tour, um, you know, and I'd organised to meet with Spanion just outside a KFC on the side of the main road. It was full yeah. like random drop parachute shit. Like, all right, bro, I'll fucking be <laughs> exactly dropping this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just like, you got to lift to that one spot, jumped off, he yeah. got off the bus, there we went. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, I'd organised to, yeah, have a chat with a fellow called Wayne Howlett. Uh, and he's pretty, he's pretty very well known in Tassie. He's a world champion uh, heavyweight lifter when it comes to weights, but yeah, he's also big boy. yeah, he's a big fella. And, yeah, but he's also um yeah, he's been in and out of the system. He kind of grew up in the streets in Tassie, mm. and he's a very uh, intelligent, articulate guy. Yeah, especially for the life that he's come from. So yeah. I thought it'd be perfect to you know for him to have a chat with Spanion. I've watched Wayne help motivate so many people into turning their lives away yeah. from the street and from crime. Um, you know. He's always focused on sports and that. So I thought, you know, this is good. and um, Yeah, and so we just did it, man. But as soon as the night before, when Spanion got to Tassie and he put on his Instagram, I'm in Hobart, every single one of his followers yeah. just were on fire. Everyone was yeah. searching for him. My phone yeah, started I guess going if nuts. You see, if you see that Spanion's in Tasmania, you're like, he's definitely going to go to Bridgewater at some point. Yeah, well, you, man, know? People, you just figure it out. As soon as he landed, people were driving down from Devonport. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, it's, there's he's, not much. Yeah, he's become Hood Jesus. It's well, he, crazy. he really is. Like, Which he, he would uh, refute profusely. Well, this, well, the <laughs> that thi- title. But The thing is, like, you have to give it to God. And this is when yeah. the blessings come in, you have to give it like this is the problem with humans. They think they're gods. And as soon as when mm. humans get too carried away with their power, yeah, and they go into the fact that they think, Oh no, I'm a god, it's me. It's not. If you, if the power was working through you and you're allowing Jesus to walk through you, yeah. You know, like there was this moment during the so vlog. Spanion's, Spanion's very, very religious. He is, yeah. yeah. And you know, And I don't know if he was always like that. Or he's, or or, or he's, uh, or if it's recent to him, or if he's just recently become very vocal about it. Well, he has. I think, you know, he really Jesus for him is how he changed his life around. He had one moment where he was in jail, where Jesus spoke to him. He looked in the mirror and he went, "What the fuck am I doing?" 
So this is why I want to read this book. You can't yeah. get his book anywhere because the publishers have pulled it. Yeah, fully. I but, imagine this is in his book. Yeah, and it was a similar moment for me, man. Like, yeah. I, for me, it wasn't Jesus because I still haven't come to terms with that word at that point. Yeah. But for me, I had this moment of like, oh, if I love myself mm. properly, everything in my life can be good. Yeah. And that's what God is. God is unconditional love. And when you find God, it's finding unconditional love for yourself. Yeah. And because God is forgiveness. Mm. And when you've had a hard life where you've made fucking mistakes like Spanion has and like I have, yeah. we've got, you know, like everybody has. Like everybody has. Sometimes it takes more extreme mistakes yeah. for you to have to find that forgiveness even harder. Mm. Like for me, I nearly killed someone. I put him in a coma. Yeah. And I felt guilt and I mm. felt a lot of people looking down at me from it. So. For me to free myself from other people's judgment, I had to forgive myself. Yes. And the idea of what God is and finding God and repenting my sins mm -hmm. helped me forgive myself because I believe God is inside us. I believe Jesus is inside us. And well, I think Spanion does too. That's very, that's, that uh, idea is so much more Jesus than what most churches and priests mm. practice. Like, if you if you read the Bible and you have a look at what Jesus actually did, mm. like it, even if you just even if you don't even if you even if you don't believe that he's the Son of God, or if you believe that he was just like a really nice guy mm. that truly believed he was the Son of God, if you look at what he actually did, that witnesses have seen, he hung out with prostitutes, yeah, with yeah. lepers, with criminals, yeah, yeah. and there's quotes of him saying that like a rich man has a better chance of getting into heaven than uh, fitting through the eye of a needle, mm. you know, like all, all of this, or a better chance of fitting through the eye of the needle than he does getting into heaven, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like uh, all of this stuff of like, yeah, he, he was there to save people and forgive people. Yeah, yeah. And how do you forgive well, a perfect a, person? Yeah, it's you not know, a bad the, who, who needs forgiveness the most? It's the person that's made the most mistakes. 100%. And I learned this in jail that, like, you know, fucking being morally confronted, being around people that have done stuff that I fucking don't agree with, but. I had to learn that only God could judge. Yeah, because you're because you're in because when you commit a violent offense, you go in with the murderers. There's oh, no, yeah. there's not really a scale for violent offense. It's oh, it's you all, go in with them. It's all in one, really. Yeah, you know? like in the prison system, everyone's in there. You yeah, know? so it just you, depends depends on the culture around it. But yeah, yeah. So like, oh man, it's crazy, bro. When I look at what God is, and the more that I understand God, the more. I develop a closer relationship to God. And for me, I'm I'm developing a closer relationship with all of it, you know. Um, I know Spanian, for example, is like Jesus Christ is the only way. Mm. But I had the feeling of Jesus before I understood Jesus. Yeah. And like I think um, I think cultures and I think ideology and humans trying to argue their experience with other uh, humans is where the problem at problematic aspect of all this shit comes into yes, it. Yes, yeah. But, man, like, through the whole vlog, and, you know, once again, yeah, I met up with Spanion outside KFC. We walked through Glenorchy. Um, a fan pulled up and was like, what are you doing? And we're like, oh, we've got to go to Gagebrook. So he's like, I'll give you the lift. Yeah. Like, we just jumped in a random guy's car. It wasn't fucking planned. Yeah. And he was like, oh, sweet, sweet as, bro. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we barely, me and Wombat barely could fit in the back. Yeah. And um, then we went to Gagebrook. We got there. There was probably about 30 or 40 people there when we got there, you know, all hanging around the local shop. Yeah. Um, and from Were they then, coincidentally there or did they have a feeling Spaniard would show up? Well, the guy that I'd organised to meet, who was a rapper called Music. Because if you're in Tassie, there's only really like three, if he's doing a hood tour, there's only really like three three suburbs or so that oh, he's a definitely going to hit. There's three sides of town. Yeah. There's like the northern suburbs, there's the eastern shore, and yeah. then there's down south in Kingston where I grew up. Yeah. Um, And in those little areas, there's probably like four suburbs to that area. You know, like you've yeah. got Bridgewater, Gagebrook, Herdsman's Cove, you know. But the Eastern Shore, you got like Clarendon Vale, Rugby, Risdon Vale, similar yeah. things, all segregated house sort of yes. communities within the hills. And um, but yeah, they definitely knew he was coming because the thing is, when we got to Glenorchy yeah. at about eleven thirty, there was all the kids in Glenorchy. They got a photo, they put it up, 
You yeah, know what over. I mean? Like yeah. over. Yeah. Everyone knows he's out. Yeah. Every youth with a dirt bike is there. You yeah. know, I want to be in the video. <laughs> looking for someone to take a selfie, look yeah. in the background. Oh, yep, that's engaged book. He's there now. Yeah. They're down five minutes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's Tazzy Small. Tazzy Small. And so, yeah, everyone, man, like I've had people be like, oh, I saw you put up a status saying we'll be at Gagebrook in half now. That never happened. People yeah. say like, oh, you did this, you did that. None of that shit happened. I was too busy trying to fucking info dump the Spaniard the whole time about convict history of Tasmania. Yeah. You know, like <clears throat> I wasn't worried about people being there. I was more worried about getting my info dump ridiculous rabbit hole knowledge of Tasmania out. Yeah. I talked on that camera for five hours. The vlog went for half an hour. <laughs> his poor, his poor editor went through some shit. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. Like, yeah, shout out to Spanion's editor. He went through a lot. A mission. Yeah. yeah, and he had to cut a lot out. He would have fucking, he'd have PTSD from the stories I told him. That <laughs> it was hectic. Yeah. So many fucking random, uh, you know, fuck. There was so much cut out that, um, yeah, would have upset the apple cart even more. I was yeah. talking about deep police corruption. I was talking about satanic rituals at Mona. I was talking yeah. about all the weird shit that they, you know, sprinkle up and make look cool mm. to hide the fact it's fucking dark and weird. But yeah, you know, I was kind of, I was hoping that got in there because the fuck, I wouldn't have minded stirring some of that shit up. But at the end of the day, man, it was just fucking positive. We went out to Gagebrook. Yeah. Everyone was there that was stoked. I know these communities. I've known these communities for a long time. You know, I saw the mother of a child whose father was a big fan of mine who got murdered while I was in prison and I wrote a song about him. I haven't mm. seen her since that happened. Do you know wow. what I mean? Like um, I saw so many teenagers whose dads and uncles I knew from prison mm. that are, you know, really kind of kids that have had it rough and they haven't got their, you know, fathers around or this or that, you know, so to see those kids that happy. Yeah. And I walk past these kids every day in the fucking mall watching them getting picked on by the cops. They're not happy kids. And yeah, I don't blame I, them yeah. for the chip on their shoulders because I used to have the same chip on my shoulder because yeah. I was growing up in an environment that didn't really understand me or support me and I didn't feel loved because my dad wasn't there. You yeah. know? And so to see Spanian in those environments and to be there myself, connecting with the community. And the thing is, because Tassie's so small, yeah, this community is so used to me. There's a lot of people that just hate me because they're used to me. I talk yeah. a lot and they're just like, Oh, fuck, Greeley's talking again. Fuck, good dickhead. You know, like, I've got yeah. heaps of that tall poppy syndrome. Yeah. So to be back there and going, seeing even guys that I know probably think I'm a bit of a dickhead, we go, hey, the Spaniards here. And they're like, oh, fuck. You know what yeah. I mean? It was yeah. just so positive. Um, you know, the yeah, worst I thing that... I think that's what's really... Spanian gets a lot of hate because he talks about his past. Mm. But... What he's actually able to do because of his past and the mistakes that he's made and grown from is he can actually show an alternate path to people who are still doing that shit yeah. or who are who feel like they want to start doing that yeah, shit. That's the most important thing, man. Yeah. Like I, for every person that wants to judge me on the internet, like they have been in the last week, Yeah. if I can use the fact that I was in Spanian's vlog... Yeah. To help connect with a young fella who's yeah. 16 years old who might be starting a life of crime, yeah. who is already breaking into construction sites, he's already living on the streets, he's already getting on ice with his mates because he thinks that's what he needs to do. Yeah. And then one of his mates went and bashed a cop with a hammer. This is a real yeah. story. Yeah. But now because he knows that I'm friends with Spanion and he looks up to Spanion yeah. and he's now listening to me, that yeah. same kid has gone back to school. He's gone back to grade 10. He's yeah. apologised to his nan for the trouble he's caused. He's yeah. reconnected with his nan. And now he's moving back in with his dad. Yeah. And that's six months ago, beautiful. he was on the street. Yeah. Two steps away from going to jail. His best mate just went to jail for bashing a cop with a hammer. Yeah. And he was hitting me up like, how do I talk to my friend in prison? I'm like, you can't really, bro. You have to wait for them to put you on the list and blah, 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 blah. And he's going, fuck, I didn't realise it was this hard. And I'm like, yeah, bro. Prison yeah. sucks. It's not fun. If your friends go to prison, it's going to be hard to stay friends with them unless you go to prison too. And this I, is what yeah, happens. Yeah, I visited you in mm. prison twice. It fucking sucked. Yeah, it's fucking it hard. It sucked. Sending you letters, it's really difficult. Mm. I wasn't even there. Yeah, yeah. And it's really hard. 100%. And that's when you're in there and everyone's free, how can I talk to you? It's like, wait. You know, yeah. I've got to put your number on the list to then have to get... Da, 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 and then in three weeks, once I spend $6 per phone call to give yeah. you a call for 10 minutes... You know what I mean? It's a mission, man. And, yeah, um, and think the. I, I think a lot like um, to point out something like a lot of people hear stuff 
like that about you influencing this kid and, and helping him fix his life up. A lot of people just kind of think, oh, he saved this kid. Mm. Yes, but also think of how much harm you've prevented to oh, yeah, other yeah. people. Because it, that's that's what it is. And like I've, uh, you know, like I've I've talked about it a lot. I've been a, I've been a foster father, and mm. and uh, you know took took my son in, and it's and it's like what I've kind of taken away from it and all the shit that I've been through and, and, and seeing a lot of harm committed to a lot of people close to me in my life mm. is the only response. There's, there's two ways to respond to it. And that is to fucking embrace that darkness and continue the harm that you see and put it out there in the world. Mm. Or it's to respond with love mm. and kind of where I've kind of landed on, especially for men is you have to be a good man. Mm. which is really hard and you know. and and being a good man is not the absence of causing harm mm. uh that's that's being a neutral observer mm. being a good man is actually noticing the opportunities to do good mm. and taking taking that up and doing it mm. um and that's that's really hard to do because oh. you can often do that at the expense of yourself yeah. For sure. You see that happen all the time where people help others to death mm. and then they have nothing left and they burn out. Yeah. Uh, but kind of what I've learned from from my whole experience and, and, and like helping people but then also seeing like the effects of people who were never helped in their life mm. harming other people, uh, it's, it's like, fuck, if there was like a, a good man in that person's life, maybe all of this shit could have been prevented so much harm and evilness is committed in the world because uh there was a because a father wasn't there or a father was there and he was abusive or yeah, you know i think well man like even the culture around especially with men and women you know like yeah well there's and, a, an awful violence against women culture problem here in australia massively but there's also comes with it's an objectification as well, you know. Yep. Like, there's a massive, uh, I've and I've noticed, I noticed, noticed it massively in the hip hop scene because there is so much misogyny that comes with it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've really, for who I am in the hip hop scene, I try and support a lot of female artists in the in the hip hop scene, authentically and the right way, because you know, and even tra you know, chat with some of these wonderful women that mm. are talented artists. Yeah. Um, and there's, they're so used to people trying to show them kindness in the way of trying to take something from them. You know what I mean? And yes. the more I, like, support and I'm just like, I don't want nothing from you. Mm. I'm trying to uplift you. You know what I mean? I can watch how much they're like, what the fuck? Which is a massive sign of how culturally acceptable this shit is. Mm. And there's this thing with Spanian. You know, he says, yeah, I'd lay, blah, 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 and talks about crimes that he did. The Spaniard's a married man. Mm. He goes to the gym. He doesn't take drugs or drink alcohol. He doesn't promote misogyny. He's not promoting women in, you know, G-strings and all this sort of shit. No, he's, like, actually a fucking good role model Yeah. Um, for where he's at in life. He's living a very fucking good life. And this is the thing. When I I think back when I first saw Spaniard, when he just got out, he was still fucking carrying all this armour. This yeah. protection that he developed over years of having to protect himself in mm. jail, on the street, everything. Yeah. When I was walking with him through the hood and you'd see, you know, a mum with her two daughters come up, could I please get a fan photo? And Spain would be like, yeah, like he's yeah. he's a really kind. Mm. Like he's healed so much. Spanian's yeah. healing journey is one of the most empowerful things that this country has been able to witness. Because we're talking yeah. about a guy who was an extreme... It can be very dangerous. Yeah. He has no fear. You know, I'd heard a Spaniard before he got to the internet. You know what I mean? Mm. And he was pretty renowned and notorious, which a lot of, like, I've got heaps of mates like him. My mate Kane, you know, Kane is a very similar guy to Spaniard. Kane has served 15 years in jail by the time he was 30 years old. Half his life. Half his life. From the age of 11 to 30, he'd spent, in 19 years of his life, he'd spent a total of 15 locked up. And, and, you know, and I, and like, once again, 
when I say I help people, I'm not trying to take responsibility or take fucking whatever. I'm not trying to say it's me. I'm the magic person. For me to help anyone, they have to want to help themselves. You you but can uh, this you is can be I a positive example. This is yeah. what I learned from America: is that empowering. Yeah. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah. And that's what I do to people. Okay, you can do this. Yes. You can do yeah. this. Don't let the tall poppy syndrome fucking get in the way. Yeah. Don't think, oh yeah, whatever. It's just a fucking dream. Like yeah. when I met Kane in jail, some of his best mates were like, Kane will never fucking be a rapper. Kane's dropping a single today with TKO. Sick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's fucking four and a half years. Mm. And he's dropping a track with one of the biggest straight rappers in Australia. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's gone from being told not possible to yeah. absolute reality mm. in five, four or five years, you know. Yeah. And so, and that's what I do. I just fucking info dump and empower people. And I yeah. always try and like, be articulate in the way that I acknowledge all the fears and doubts and all this sort of stuff, but then bring it back to the empowerment. And yet, Kane has now not been in jail for five years. When Kane was a criminal, if you Google him, he's a scary co- motherfucker. Yeah, but aside yeah. from that, he was just like, he was, he had no other ladder to climb. Of course. He had no other opportunities to really fit into for where he was at when he was young. So he went, I'm going to be the best at what I do, which was crime. Yeah. And, you know, Kane had seizures, seizures, not seizures, but a siege when all the cops rocked up and yeah. Kane was on top of the house. He's lobbing bricks. He set his own house on fire. The amount of tax money that Kane Richardson cost Tasmania <laughs> was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Five years. That's why you guys None. didn't have an AFL team for so long because yeah, of yeah, Kane, yeah, Richardson. Kane Richardson. They no. could have built a stadium off that. No, true, <laughs> true. But, man, like he has not fucking cost the taxpayers any money since he, as soon as he yeah, yeah. like he you know um yeah I, I've, a, I've met him i i think once or maybe twice but yeah, yeah. just the tu- just the obvious turnaround that i've seen and i'm a stranger to him mm. but it's very obvious to me and i think that's the like that's the the power of being a good man mm. is actually being able to lead by example just believing in and yourself. and grab someone's hand mm. and go, you, you come with me, you can do it. And that's not doing it for them. That's not fixing them. Mm. That's just showing them an alternative and then giving them access to some tools 100%. and then going, I believe in you. Mm. Uh, and that's like so fucking powerful, especially with men because there are so many men out there that don't have dads or that they do, they've got bad dads mm. or they come from bad families or they've only ever had bad male examples. Yeah, well, and, and a lot of that comes down. out and it's all passed down. And a lot of that comes out in violence and anger and mm. hatred of, of, uh, of, you know, heaps of people. And, and a lot of that, a lot of that falls on women mm. um, who are the victims of that shit all the time. Well, it's, um, like it's and crazy, man, the I'm... only cure to that is, is to, you know, be be good men to teach others how to follow down that path. That's it. That's, yeah, it's very interesting, bro. I think back to my relationships in the past and it's interesting, bro, because most, like for me, yeah, a lot of my trauma came from circumstances around my father not being there, which made me angry. Yeah. And therefore I trauma bond with women whose fathers weren't around either. Yeah. You know, and I've been in a couple toxic relationships where it's it's a hard one because you as a man, you're trying to help heal a woman whose pain comes from a man. Mm. You know what I mean? And, you know, they say that the pain in every woman's eyes is at the hands of another man, you know? The hard thing is, as a man, the pain in my eyes comes from a man too. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's such a fucking hard dynamic. And it's a hard thing to heal. And But once again, you have to do the work yourself. You know, for me in the yeah. last year, I just like, I reconnected with my dad. He's on the other side of the world. But we went through our whole life together, relived it, retalked it out, went through every moment to understand, oh, this emo- these were the emotions I was going through at three years old. I can't remember those emotions. Yeah. But I went through them at three years old and they became a part of my nervous system. Yes. Which then made me angry. Yeah. Permanently. 
Yeah. You know, and then you're angry permanently. You're walking around with a frown on your face. Someone goes, Oi, what's your fucking problem? All of a sudden you're in a fight. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't even remember. <laughs> But all of a sudden yeah. you're in a fight and then you've got another and you get bashed and then you've got yeah. another trauma to add on top of that. Yeah. And you're like, well, I got bashed because like I was scar. angry. Yeah. yeah. And then like, and then all of a sudden you get into a relationship where you bond with someone over the trauma and then that becomes toxic and traumatic and then both another one. Mm. So let's say the original trauma, which is dad not being there, all of a sudden is at the bottom of your backpack of like, yeah. oh, and you got bashed and your girlfriend and, and all of a sudden you've got a full backpack and yeah. you're fucking too heavy. And, this is and where... then you go, why am I so angry? You look in the backpack and it's like, oh, because last week this happened. And yeah. it's like, no, it's actually because fucking two decades ago that happened, which kicked off all of this mm. shit. And you're only looking at, oh, well, you know, if I didn't lose at the pokies last week, I wouldn't be so pissed off. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, no, this no, is this is because chain. this yeah. horrible thing happened to you that you can vaguely remember. Mm. It's, a, it's a long Long, long line of them, man. And this, when you go through trauma in any way, you are more susceptible to be like when you've been sexually abused. Yeah. Unfortunately, you are more susceptible to because you're a bit normalized to it. Yeah. And it's the same with like hurt yeah, people, hurt drugs. people. You know, yeah. like when I was like fucking very young and I was just smoking weed, I didn't realize, you know, when they say it's a gateway drug, well, it might not, let's say, you know, if you smoke a bit of weed, you're not going to get on heroin next week. Yeah. But all of a sudden, before you smoked weed, you might have been like, oh, I'm never going to do drugs. And then you're like, oh, I've smoked a bit of weed. Fast forward eight years, you're in a, in a house with people with needles hanging out their arms. And so, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I was so blessed that I still didn't go that far down it. But all of a sudden, I got to a stage of like, oh, I've normalized this and allowed myself to keep normalizing it yeah. until I'm in a situation that, luckily enough, is confronting enough for me to walk away. You know, yeah, well, you see that all are. the time where, like, uh, where <coughs> if you go out to a nightclub uh, and you drink alcohol, uh, if if you're a regular alcohol drinker, you're – so say for me, I'm sober. I've never, mm. never touched drugs and never drunk. So when I go Very out – You're 30 now. Yeah. He did it. 30. Yeah. No drugs. That's crazy. No alcohol. No bit, cigarettes. Bit of Oxycontin. <laughs> and he's friends with me. A yeah. little bit of Oxycontin during yeah. the fuck. A yeah. little bit of Oxycontin. A couple of right. spoonfuls. A couple of spoons of Oxy. Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but prescribe. Prescribe. Um, Pharmaceutical. But like for me, when I go out, uh, if I look at me versus my friends, when I go out, if I'm at a bar or a club, I'm saying no to alcohol. Hmm. That's that's the thing that I have to say no to. Mm. All my friends who drink because there's not even a consideration of a yes or no for alcohol, they're saying no to Coke. Mm. So it's like one night, maybe I'll drink. Mm. But one night, maybe they'll do Coke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they're doing Coke, they like it. Now they're saying no to ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's a, that's how I kind of look at the gateway thing of like yeah. you start smoking weed. Or before you smoke weed, you'll be saying no to cigarettes. And it's the same Do you with, know what I mean? Yeah, it's the same with all uh, self gratification. Yeah, you know, and this is why this is why we're seeing what's happening with Diddy and all these cunts. It's because mm. that's it. They they like all right, we'll have a bit of party, a bit of a bit of fucking loose orgy, and then all of a sudden, sex can be like that. Yeah, it's F the same F thing. It can be like that with food. I won't have dessert. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now you have dessert every night. Oh, yeah. I won't have two desserts. Exactly, you know? man. It's a it's a creeping scale. That's why whenever. People are often like, oh, it's so fucking amazing that you don't drink and you don't do drugs. I don't know how you've done that. But well, they're, they're looking at it from the perspective of quitting. Mm. That's way harder than never starting, exactly, in my yeah. view. I just had to not succumb to peer pressure, basically. Mm. And that, now that I'm 30, has completely left my life because everyone knows that I'm sober. I don't even get offered anymore no. except by a stranger who has no sway over me. Yeah. Uh, and then they find out and they go, oh, he must have been a bad alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll yeah, never yeah, offer yeah. again, you know. Oh, the, Whereas the, the people always like, how have you done that? It's like, well, I never had to quit. I, I yeah. never started. Like quitting is way harder than what I've done. Well, yeah, the peer pressure in Australia around drinking is hectic. Like I don't really drink very much. It was, it was horrible still, when I was a teenager. Yeah. Like I, I was heavily, heavily excluded mm. from the ages of 16 to like 19 yeah. by people because I didn't drink because they assumed that I would judge them, mm. which is like that tall poppy syndrome. Oh, you want to do something? You think you're better than me? Yeah. Oh, you don't want to drink? You think I'm an alcoholic? That's and it's so like, true. no. It's so true. Like, yeah, every time that I, 
be put in a situation where someone's like, hey, man, we'll have a beer. And I'm like, I'm actually all good. Yeah. I really don't like the taste of it. Yeah. It doesn't, I don't not get any bonus out of doing this. I'd actually rather drink water. Yeah. You know, and, and then it's a reflection of like, oh, well, we can't be friends then. That's sort of like I feel like recently I met a guy and he's like, mate, well, why don't we, why don't we go for a drink? And I was like, I'm all good, bro. I actually just released a new song. And he's like, yeah. Well, why don't you want to get pissed? And I'm like, I actually just want to chill out and do some more writing. Yeah. That's my celebration. Yeah. I just put out a song. I want to do some writing. Yeah. And he just was like really upset and a bit offended and hurt that I didn't want to drink with him. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. we're going to go to a pub where I have to yell over a loud environment to talk about whatever, like yeah. while we do this and then I wake up feeling a bit more shit. There's no prizes. No, no. You, know, and you can have some good loose times. You can have some fun. Don't get me wrong with the right people, but... Um, I've never when I was when I was younger because I, I I seriously can sit like I, I seriously was like all right initially it was just I'm gonna wait till I was 18 mm. and then I saw what it did to all of my friends and I just kind of I remember I remember just sitting down and I was like I'm gonna like what's gonna happen if I start or if I don't start and I was just like well I don't think I've ever seen someone's life improve by starting or get considerably better. Mm. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone go, going, thank fuck I drank my whole life or thank goodness. Mm. Maybe there's a lot of that with weed. There's a lot of people who yeah, go, without man. weed, I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't no. be as creative or whatever. There's yeah, a little yeah. bit of it with that. Well, same as that. You know, I think weed, it's God's creation. Once again, Yeah. Um, anything can be abused, but I feel that everything that we use in a healthy way that is a part of... What's been here for thousands of years? Yeah. There's a healthy way to use marijuana. There's a healthy way to use mushrooms. There's a healthy yeah. way to use DMT. Um, in my experience, because once again, I grew up trying to experience all this sort of stuff. I took all the drugs. By the time I was 16, I remember like in my 16th year, I tried like 12 new drugs. Wow. Got a list in my head. I was like, I'm doing them all this year. You know what I mean? And what I've seen fear and loathing in Las Vegas. I want to try the suitcase. Meanwhile, you know, when, like when I was 16, I was like, oh, I, if I, uh, I reckon I can get um, all of the new 52 DC comics and I can finally understand yeah. the overarching story of the post Flashpoint <laughs> universe. That's the, Bro, that's the difference. Our autisms just went neither way. Yeah. Yours are just like DC comics. Mine was like all the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm gonna have all the drugs. I wonder yeah. what the entire bat family's up to right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to understand the overarching concept of all drugs put together. <laughs> but um, but man, like, and now I'm fucking 35 this year, and I'm having the same spiritual experiences that I used to get on DMT and mushrooms when I was a kid. Now sober through God, and through yeah. chan and channeling my. Energy, being in control of my vibrations and the frequencies that I'm trying to put out to the world in different ways. And well, it's really interesting mm. that, like, if you look at like Buddhist monks and all this kind of stuff, all the, all those guys that talk about enlightenment through mm. meditation, and then all of a sudden mushrooms kind of blow up, and everyone's talking about enlightenment through psychedelics. And it's like, uh, I I can't remember who who said it, but it was this really interesting Buddhist guy was just talking about like you you guys are you guys are just taking a shortcut, like it's. Exactly, a, yeah. a you guys are taking a shortcut to get to where I am temporarily. Yeah, but I'm here yeah. all the time because yeah. I climbed the mountain. Ah, that's the fucking bars, man. Yeah. This is like, even recently... Which I, was a little bit egotistical of the Buddhist monk. Yeah, <laughs> bless him. <laughs> no, I climbed no, the but, mountain. But, but, but you know, I'm, it's true, no, you know? How's this right? Yeah. Like, only a few months ago, one of my good mates, who's also a quite a spiritual fella, but he's yeah. not like, hasn't accepted God in yeah. fully yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he was like, I've got a big damn tea, let's do it. And I was like, I don't really feel like I need to, but I love this guy. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah. And I have some DMT with you. And because I'm I'm I talk to God all day, every day. Like I my relationship with God is just growing rapidly more every moment of my life. Mm. And I feel the blessings, not only in my own healing, but the real world around me, blessings are coming towards me. I feel more blessed right now more than I've ever been in my fucking life, ever. And, like, it's crazy. And it's, I've got to thank God. That's There's beautiful. moments where I feel so I feel guilty because mm. I'm like, this is too good. How <laughs> is this all happening right now? Yeah. It's impossible. I really tried hard at a lot of other things and I always fell to pieces in my hand like I was holding a broken glass together but I was still cutting my hands and I was like, ah. 
uh, yeah. I'm bleeding. And I just let it go. I give it to God. And I just fucking focused on the love. And now it's come in. It's amazing. But, yeah, so I was sitting there with my mate. And he's like, all right, let's have some DMT. And so we both smoked some DMT. And he kicked off. He smoked it first. Yeah. And then I, I smoked it. And I kicked off a bit. But the whole time I was like, this is God. And, like, the whole DMT experience, which used to be like, oh, I saw this and experienced yeah. this and that. For me, it was just like, I was going to sit through this for a couple of minutes. Mm. And then, like, as I kind of came back to from the DMT trip, and I saw the col the kaleidoscope universe that you kind of experience. But back when I was doing it without knowing God, I'd get messages from the other side. Yeah. But... When I did DMT, now knowing God, because I get messages from God nearly every day, I get downloads. Like, I'll have moments where I'll be walking down the beach and God speaks to me so hard that I have to physically bow. Like, it's like, woof. Yeah. Like the universe, God, all that is one is feeding me. You know what I mean? And, yeah, it's really full on. It is, a, it is an interesting thing, like, the... Um, the as as religion and spirituality and belief in God has plummeted, the the popularity of all of these psychedelics and stuff have kind of skyrocketed. Mm. And all of these spiritual experiences that are not ascribed to any religion or whatever. Not that they have to be. Mm. It's but it's a really interesting thing of like, oh, have psychedelics exploded because people I feel like humans just naturally need that spiritual experience. Like I think there's it's no coincidence that every pretty much every single culture in the history of humankind has some kind of religion of course. or cultural practice that involves elders or spirits or God or whatever. Mm. It's like such a it seems like to be such a natural thing that's ingrained into our DNA. Well, Whereas they... in at least in like the Western world atheism the rise of atheism and like the fall of religion all this kind of stuff where it's like you were great i remember in high school it was like oh fuck he goes to church that's fucking crazy mm. um and when i started going to youth group uh to see what it was like i was like fuck i don't know if i'm gonna tell anyone because this is weird what do they think i'm crazy it, but it's like psychedelics and stuff kind of given like this socially acceptable spiritual experience yeah and a lot of that has to do with the the bad reputation that religion has given itself, well, and it's to do because of the bigotry and the control yeah, and the control. all so that stuff. If we go f like the word cult, a mm. cult is controlled with fear, which is yeah. what the church became. Yes, yeah. Culture is built with leadership. Yeah, and in my experiences of growing up in the church. There was no leadership. It was control. It was fear. It was this. It was punishment. It was hell. Mm. That was the threat. You know what I mean? It was like when those Buddhists be... showed up outside my show because I made fun of their guy. Yeah, they yeah. tried to use fear to intimidate me into silence. Yeah. They showed up in my show. They were threatening violence, so many death threats, and they protested and tried to storm the venue. Listen. Using fear to try and control me, someone who's not even part hard, of their It's a hard group. position for a Buddhist to be in because oh, they meant yeah. to, you know, that, you, know yeah. you really checkmated them, bro. Yeah, <laughs> like, I know. You fully just got them cornered. Eh? Yeah, the Buddhist trying to kill me. Yeah, no, read and your that's book. That's it. Like, I mean, <laughs> read your book. Yeah, like love protests are pretty interesting. But yeah. yeah. So when I smoked this DMT on my mate, bro. Yeah. I can't. He he went out and then I smoked mine and I just chilled there and I kind of had the DMT experience that you have. But the whole time I was like. I know God. Yeah. I know God. Like, in the past, there's, no, you know, no one knows God. But when I say I know God, I know I, that I'm following God. What I, what like, I feel about it with, with God is I've, I've always believed in, uh, in, in a God, and, uh, but I've never fully connected with any religion. Hmm. I've gone to youth group. Um, I've met lots of different, I was, uh, like I was for a bit, when I was really good, close friends with my friend Khaled, he's Muslim. I learned a lot about Islam. Um, and, uh, my mom's, uh, a hairdresser, all of her clients were Jewish. So I learned heaps about the Jewish religion. I've learned lots about the big three religions mm. and I've always, I, I worked for a, I even worked uh, for years for a Coptic Christian, mm. a guy who was a refugee from Egypt because uh, the Muslims and the Coptic Christians there have beef. His church was burned down mm. by um, by 
uh, people who hated his religion. Like he was really persecuted for believing in God and had heaps of real big conversations about his version of Christianity, which was very different to the version of Christianity that I understood, mm. which was very Westernized. And I kind of got closest to what I felt was true with him. I was like, so I said something about heaven and he goes, brother, that's not what happens in heaven. I was like, I can't wait to meet everyone when I, like if I die, I would love to meet people who I loved. And he goes, that's not what happens. When you die, your spirit is going to change into something that you right now can't even understand because yeah. you're human. Yeah. And he goes, he says something like, we can't comprehend God because he is God. Mm. And I thought that made so much sense to me. Yeah, that's it. I was like, I, 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 my, my thoughts on it is, I think that if we could comprehend God and understand exactly what he says, he wouldn't be God. It's something that's so much bigger. Yeah. That like an ant can't understand my motivations and what I want it to do and yeah. or 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 meet the idea of wanting anything or feelings. You know what I mean? It's it's mm. completely out of its ability to understand. That's what I feel You're 100% about right. And God. This, this is where you have to give it and to God. I feel like every religion has like <laughs> The, the the flavor and the sense yeah, of yeah, yeah. you know they get flashes of of what uh the the truth is mm. which is you know do unto others as you'd have done to you and yeah yeah um try to move with with uh with love and and forgive people and you know make make it a nice experience for everyone mm. yeah it's it's man it's so interesting the church i really all this human control is the counterculture of of what God is, you know, and yeah, and everything else is noise and yeah, yeah, you know, like and the the Bible is the King James Bible. Yeah, King James is a guy. Yeah, yeah, and he's gone. All right, I've made a few changes. This is my version of that's the Bible, it. and it's like, yeah, that's it. And there's you know, it says in the Bible, the Spirit will write the Word of God on your heart. You don't mm. need a Bible to find the Spirit of God. You know, all these different scriptures and all this sort of stuff that uh i've i've been using scripture in my life now to deal with a lot of different stuff uh scriptures help me understand they give me confirmation when i'm going through trials and tests and i feel like oh, god you're testing me here and then i'll hear that scripture and i'm like oh no, that's right i've got this god's yeah. got me you know like when i say i know god i know that i'm following god Mm. I've had too many experiences in my life where I had to like give it to God and God put me in the exact place that I, he needed to, you know. Um, and when my mate came out of the DMT trip, he looked at me and he went, bro, what is it? And I just went, it's God, bro. Yeah. What you're trying to get to is God. But God is with you at all times. This is the thing like I spent so much of my life feeling lost, feeling suicidal, feeling like I didn't fit in, feeling misunderstood feeling neglected, feeling abandoned, all the sorts of things. When I let God in, yeah. when I actually let God in, I dropped my walls, I dropped the trauma I had from the church, I dropped the trauma I had from my upbringing, from my family breaking down, which all led back to religious ideology. And I let <clears> God <throat> in, I realised God had been there the whole fucking time because it made me go through my whole life again and realise that every little pain and trauma and hardship that I had to go through was to me for me to be at this point now to accept myself and love myself unconditionally with God. And that's how God's a cheeky motherfucker. You know what yeah. I mean? Like God is the sense of humor in God. He'll fucking put you through the most crazy, ridiculous shit to bring you back and go, see? And you're like, oh, man, fuck. Cheeky yeah, that's, that's... You know what I mean? It's, like, uh, it's, it's the ultimate humbling experience. Like that's... I feel very similar about what I went through. I'm like, I'm the fucking shit. I'm going to make it. I'm the best. Mm. And then it was like... <laughs> it was well, like you know. COVID, lockdown foster a kid, yeah. get really sick, go through all of the surgeries all at the same time, all at once. Mm. And when I was in it, I was like, oh, my God, this is fucking horrible, all of this stuff happening at 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 once. This is so difficult. The fostering the child was a beautiful bit, mm. um, but it was also difficult. I'm like, oh, my God, all these things happening at once. What the fuck? I'm not going to make it through. And then I made it through, and then I was like, thank fuck it all happened at once mm. because all of those things took two years if they happened one after the other, that would have been eight years. Oh yeah. Lockdown was two years. Surgery was two years. Uh, uh, fostering my boy was about was little over two years, and it's like fuck. 
thank fuck that happened all at once. A blessing, bro. Um, and and now because of all of that shit that I've been through and all the shit that you've been through, if you can figure out how to process it in a healthy way and look after yourself mm. first and heal from it, you can. Uh, you get to keep. You get to do away with the suffering and put that away, mm. but you get to keep all of the resilience forever. Mm. Like all of that pain and suffering that you go through can go in a box somewhere that you that will come out every now and then, but it's not something that you always have with you. Mm. But the, that resilience, so that whenever now when bad things happen, I go, fuck, I, I wrote a will when I when I went into my surgery. I'll be all right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, straight <laughs> you know, like I've, I I know what I can endure and, and survive and come out better on the other end. Mm. You know, like thank fuck I went through all that stuff because how healthy am I now? Yeah, straight up. You know, you can see it. You can literally see it on my face mm. that I've, come through all this stuff and have come out better and and that's the the blessing of it um it's like you don't know how strong you are until you're tested you know a, yeah, a, a weak man is someone who's never been tested how do you know how strong you are and, until something happens exactly you've got no fucking idea this is um, where trauma can be a positive thing yeah and and the other thing the the positive that's the first step is like figuring it out and healing yourself mm -hmm. and moving through it and process, processing it um one when that's done then you can make the decision to kind of help other people through that by being an example and i kind of look at it with with me i'm like oh i'm actually like i was actually explaining it to i was talking about it with my son i was like now that you've kind of you've gone through these things and you've come out on the other side a lot better and you've healed a lot you can actually you can't fix anyone else mm. and you can't save anyone else that's 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 something that that uh you that can all, you can often destroy yourself trying to fix somebody else oh, yeah. what what you can do for other people that are struggling when you've been through similar stuff and come out the other end okay you can be a safe place that they can visit mm. you can be a safe place they can visit and you can kind of grab them and go it's all right and let them let it out and then just pick them up, turn them around and push them in the mm. direction that they have, they have to decide to walk. Yeah. Um, and many of them won't. And if you stay behind them, pushing them down the path, you'll end up walking backwards down to the hurt place that they're stuck in. Oh yeah. But you can, you know, that, and that to me is like, is, is being a good man mm -hmm. is being a positive example and being like, you know, I've gone through these things. Here's some love. You can do it as well. Mm. And uh, the the amount of uh, the amount of harm and damage that you can heal, and through that, prevent harm and damage being done to other people, because that's what hurt people do. It's like unfathomable. Save one person. Who knows how many people that you've prevented harm to? It's an interesting one. Not that every hurt person ends up becoming an evil monster. No, but, but it's you a hard know. one. Like, I'm going to just fuck it. I, I ran into this guy probably like six months ago. Mm. He was trying to sell drugs to 12-year-olds in the mall. Mm. And um, I got triggered and I slapped him. Mm. I told him to fuck off. And because, um, yeah, he was trying to sell fucking Lyrica, which is an extreme nerve pain damage drug. drug. Right. Kids in the mall. Fuck. And I know these kids. I know their dad. And um, no, their uncles from my time away. You know what I mean? Mm. So when, yeah, and I've known this fella since he was quite young too, but he's an adult now. And he was there trying to sell drugs to kids. And it triggered me and I slapped him mm. and told him to fuck off. And now this guy is like, he's hurt from it. And he's like carrying on every day and trying to like throw dark energy back at me. And I refuse to give back into it. There's an element of like, I, I, I regret, I put the, because I do a lot of good shit, but that was a moment where I was like, well, fuck up, I slipped, and boof, I let a bit of negative negative energy out, you know? Mm. And um, it was very interesting to analyze in hindsight. Well, a healed, and, a healed person is not a perfect person. No, exactly. There's, there is no such thing as like completely fixed. No, that's it. And there's no way, there's no such thing as your ego completely yeah. dying. It's always going to be there. You have to kind of, you know, always fight back with it. But um, yeah, and I and I ended up reaching out to this guy and I tried to be like, look, man, this is what happened. This is why I did what I did. You mm. know, 
I wish you all the best. It's time for you to put this energy down and, um, you know, your pain in regards to the way you're reacting to this situation is duly noted, but mm. I just, I'm not going to allow you to work me up to continue this because yeah. that's what he's trying to do. He's trying yeah. to like poke me more and more, yeah. to get more of a reaction. And God's given me the patience to just like fucking stand away from him. But it's very interesting, man. The more I like navigate this journey, navigate the world that I'm in, also just navigating my emotional response to it because, you know, understanding where I sit on the spectrum, how I hyper-focus, how, how much I absorb the world around me, you know, like that week also when I made that action, it was because as well I was like hyper-focusing on Palestine, I was hyper-focusing on a lot of shit. Yeah, and I was carrying all this pain, then all of a sudden, this one moment just fucking all of it came out, you know. Yeah, but for me, like, I've made mistakes, you know, and I think this is, you know, being a good man is the best thing that we can do. Not only like in regards to how we try to help other young men understand themselves. Yeah, um, how we help the people around us understand ourselves. How we treat women. There's a massive aspect to it. You know, I know there's Absolutely. so much fucking tribalism in regards to, well, feminism. And that's men, like, men and women are not fucking teams. Like, nah. that's the that's uh, that's the thing that, that shits me with all of this, like, feminism and anti-feminism and all this kind of stuff. It's like, and most of this, I think, is on the, ma- the male side of things. You know, here I'm fucking doing team stuff. But, like, you always see, you always see shit like, oh, women want this and, and women will only respect you if you do this. And it's like, are you generalizing half the fucking population? Yeah, so stupid. Like that's and and it's it's all these these people that have hypothetical arguments with invented feminists that they've seen on Twitter yeah, yeah. that don't exist in real life, yeah. and they're applying and are applying that to real life. Mm. And it's because they they don't have a fucking genuine relationship or a connection or 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 any type of communication with women with women yeah in it's, general it's the same with people that were like skits and about gay marriage do you know any gay people no yeah like you know it's same deal racism yeah do you know any black people no yeah you know like look at the referendum last year you know what i mean like yeah you even have people that don't know like God, oh, fuck man it's just crazy bro we're in such a we are in such like a virtual signaling carry on and this is why America's on edge. This is why everyone's so fucking angry is because this tribalism war of labels yeah. that we've evolved to at this point of society, we've evolved so many labels. How many boxes can you fit in? Yeah. We can give you 12 precursory titles before you even get your main title yeah. of what you are in this day and age. Yeah. You know, like even like Spanian, is, is he a Christian? Is he a... I see him being a good man in the real yeah. world. Yeah. That's what we did that day. Yeah. We went out, we showed kindness, we tried to talk to people, yeah. made them feel heard, and th- it was fucking uplifting. Yeah. You know, after we left this area, there was a, a confrontation between some youth and a cop, and a couple cop cars got smashed up. Yeah. We were nowhere near those cop cars, mm. but we're being blamed for it. Yeah. You know, the cops arrested Spanion, they went through his phone. They went through his conversations with me on Instagram. Yeah. The Tasmanian police were literally hacking <laughs> Spanion's phone, going through our yarns to yeah. see if I'd help him incite this shit. And all they all they heard was me going, yeah, bro, can't wait to see you and tell you all the stuff I know about Tassie. You know, and... And, and by the way, what a fucking <coughs> stupid idea for a video that would be. Hey, yeah. man, come out of Tasmania. Let's start a riot. Oh, man. But, Why know, the fuck would you do that? This is like, and bless your Tasmanian police, but you just made it worse. Yeah. If you guys never rocked up. 100%. There wouldn't have been any cop cars smashed. Yeah. If you didn't arrest Spanion, everyone wouldn't be going on about it. You guys gave us free promotion, Tasmania police. Yeah. I hope you understand this. If you guys want to run down Spanion and what he does and go, oh, well, this is unacceptable. All of you carrying on. Yeah has promoted it heaps more. Creating the adverse adversarial energy. I mean, even like 
You're, you're doing the work for us. Absolutely. Like, I remember, I mean, this goes years back. I remember when I had, like, a bunch of fans show up to, like, uh, the, the Janoskians thing. Mm. The cop showed up as well. And they were looking for a reason to arrest me. They wanted to arrest me. They were so upset. Mm. I was there making sure the entire crowd was mellow, keeping our crowd separate from the other crowd. I was any people would like whisper about throwing shit. I say, do not throw shit. We're not going to fucking throw anything. I was keeping it all nice and mellow. Then the cops just picked a random reason to arrest me. They, I touched a sign that had a penis on it. So they arrest me for, for being, it wasn't my sign. I signed it for someone else's. I was in possession of offensive material is what they said. Oh, yeah. They arrested me for that. Guess what? As soon as I was gone, it, fucking went off yeah. because the cops took the de-escalator yeah. me out of the situation and then escalated the fuck out of it mm. 150 cops show up it turned into a fucking riot because they showed up yeah man it's exactly what happened and not 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 because they showed up because they showed up with that energy it's if they weird. showed up if they had 100 guys off to the side and a few guys came up had a chat to me hey man here's the rules can you work with us mm. to keep this safe? That would have been the best thing. Mm. If the cops went up to you in Spain, you were like, hey, mate, can we do this? Can you help us do that? You would have helped. Oh, we did. Well, like, so when the cops got there, one of the cops knew who I was, and he was like, oh, come on, Greeley. And I was like, yeah, man, we're just cruising through, bro. We're out. We're not yeah. sticking around. And he goes, well, good, because the cavalry is on the way. And we're like, okay. And at that point, we told people to chill out. Yeah. We told, told people to stop following us. Yeah. We took a shortcut and we went up over the hill through the bush. Yeah. So we shit was getting a bit he hectic right at the shops there mm. where we first arrived in, in Gagebrook. And then we went and the cops rocked up and we went, no worries. Hey, guys, we got a crook. Like, shh. And we yeah. tried to calm people down. And people was just there following us. Like, rah, 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 and just yeah. try, And we're like, yeah, yeah, we're trying to make a vlog. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we've gone through and ducked over, over the hill. It's and so it, funny, all of that for what it, what is essentially a vlog filmed on a GoPro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all it was. It's crazy. Yeah. But, um, and then, yeah, we get to the other side of the hill and we're walking down and that's when someone come up and goes, oh, I heard they just smashed a cop car, you know. Yeah. Mind you, the night before this all happened in Tasmania, there was a death in custody yeah. under Tasmania's police watch. Yeah. And right now... You know, everyone's up in arms about Spanion and Greeley fucking doing this and, you know, I'm copping a lot of people, fuck you, Greeley, you just do this for that, blah, 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 mm. blah, blah. Because a couple of cop cars got smashed up. Yeah. When someone died in police custody and no one is questioning it. What's yeah. more important, human life or a bunch of government paid for cars? Like, yeah. it's it's, and... I'm not trying to just deflect and take the attention away from what the drama was that was a result of us being in the area mm. after we left. I'm not going to deny that that is somewhat yeah. linked, you know. But once again, like, yeah, you look at every... Spaniard said it well. You look at every fight at every football game, which there's plenty. You know, I've been in Melbourne after an AFL game. There's mm. a lot of damage that gets caused from drunk AFL fans. Yeah. Heaps. Yeah. We've seen it over the years. Yeah. They don't blame the football. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they still have the football next year. Yeah. You know? And yeah. that's the thing. You can't, like... Yeah, I know the cops in Tassie have given Spanion some crazy sort of rules of what he can and can't do when he, he's back in Tasmania and all yeah. sorts of shit. Which just proves how much they're trying to cover shit up as well. Like, it's just all... It's all very interesting. But I'll tell you what. All I say in it my is world. pretty. It is pretty crazy mm. for a guy from a lower socioeconomic background mm. going back into those areas. A guy who's created a positive outcome mm. from being born and 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 you know negatively influenced by that environment mm. to go in there and tell the story of people who are currently there and show how people live. And what he's not he's not going in there and being like. Ugh, look at these yucky paws. No. This is fucked. What he's actually doing is he's showing how people live and he's and often going, I can't believe they let people live like this in government housing. Mm. Look how fucked these flats are that people, that single mums are supposed to live in. Mm. This doesn't look very safe. And he's pointing out 
how dilapidated and neglected a lot of areas in Australia are. Mm. It's very interesting that the police are upset at poor people finally getting a little bit of a megaphone to talk about how they live currently. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And this is also what he's doing that, once again, people forget. Let's say you're eight years old. And yeah. you, li- you, don't, you don't really know too much about the world. You're eight. You know what I mean? Yeah. But all you know is everyone's like, Spaniards coming, Spaniards here. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, who's Spanian? This guy must be pretty fucking amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Everyone's going on about him. Oh, look how happy my older brother is. Look how happy, you know. Yeah. Wow, this is cool. Who's Spaniard? So you come out of the house and you see this guy walking through the street with everyone following him. And everyone's, you know, let's say they're doing burnouts. Let's say they're doing shit, which is excitement in that world. Yeah. It's like... Well, what do I like to do? I like to go to summer nights or I like to go to, you know, <coughs> the races. That's what I did as a kid. We yeah. went to the Derby, you know, like fucking. And so you see all this stuff and then you're like, all right, when I get Instagram, I'm going to follow Spanion. What does this guy do? And you're like, oh, he goes to church. He goes to the gym. He doesn't take drugs. He doesn't drink. He doesn't promote misogyny. He's mm-hmm. a married man. It's a fucking pretty good role model. He talks about how he how he used to do crime and he learned better and now he does not and exactly. crime is putrid lad. Yeah, it's putrid lad. And and the fact is... You that's see, exactly the type of fucking... Ro- I mean, that's why the, all of the best social workers are ex-crims yeah. or people who have been through abuse themselves. Yeah, because people need to relate to people to understand. Yeah. To, like, no one can ever ever become someone that they don't relate to. It's just, you know, like, mm. it's not, what's the point? Like, it's, and, you know, this is what I try and do with everyone I talk to, from when I chill with Kane to, you know, to everyone. I try and find exactly where I relate to them, you know, yeah. and what point. Because what, what, who else, like, if these, these kids with no dads mm. who are surrounded by a lot of negative influence and there's no fucking opportunities and not there's no pool mm. where they can go swim and the, they, no. they demolish the skate park, you know, who are they going to relate to? The 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 police officer, Spanian, you know. That's who Spanian. they're going to relate to. That's what that's what they and need. Then, honestly, How much like, time do we have on the card, Keelan? Sorry. We have thirty minutes left. Okay, good, good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, and um, yeah. So bringing it all back to everything we're talking about, you know, it's very important in this world to be a good man. You know, I said in the vlog with Spanian, mm. I go, "You do good as fucking all scared because you work in your jobs." And that upset a lot of people. Yeah. But you have to understand my experience. I've been through a lot of situations, even just recently. Like, I was walking through Hobart Mall. There was a young, like, 15-year-old girl sitting on the pavement, profusely bleeding out her hands. Mm. Like, she was trying to cover the blood up and hide it. And I saw her. I looked around. There was, like, six people in suits that had just knocked off work. Yeah. Well aware of the fact that this girl is bleeding profusely on the ground. And all of them are ignoring her. And and that's this is this is this is what I'm talking about. I've got a story about this after this as well. Mm. This is what I'm talking about. The difference, like a good man is not a person who who does not cause harm. Mm. A good man is a person who who actively decides to do good things. Mm. And you're when you're presented with opportunities. So this girl, this is not just you. Everyone walking past her. This girl is that opportunity presenting yeah. itself to especially men yeah. to to do good and be good, to 100%, help. 100%, you know. And and those 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 men aren't causing harm mm. by walking past her necessarily. Kind of they are. Yeah, yeah. But they're not, it, they're, it's not, um, it's, they're not looking at her and going, I'm not going to help her. Mm. They're not going, fuck her, I don't care. Mm. So they're not being maliciously harmful but they're not they they they're not even many of them are not even seeing the opportunity to help and i well that's the thing and like when i saw her and i realized i went fuck you know and like man like i luckily had my bag yeah i had a spare t-shirt i had some betadine like yeah. i tried to do what i could you know what i mean yeah but i was that's what i analyzed afterwards i'm like why isn't anyone help, else helping and i looked at, i sat there and like blatantly stared at one bloke in a suit mm. who was there like looking on his phone and just doing everything he could to ignore the situation while he waited for the bus to get home from work. I can't help but blame the fact that people are so worried about their A to B, them going to work, I need to do this to go here and I haven't got enough time to risk possibly allowing this into my life mm. because humans are so en- enslaved in their own worries 
especially in a country where the cost of living is ridiculous. Yeah. That's the other thing I think in a, like if that had happened in a in a poorer country, someone would have helped us straight away. But everyone's yeah. so terrified about the cost of living. Well, I've got to go to work and band-aids cost me this much, so I can't even spare a yeah. band-aid for her. Come on, darling, don't you know about the price of living in Australia? What are you doing bleeding on the ground? You know what I mean? Like it's and I can't a, a help lot of her. a lot of a lot of a more empathetic view of that as well is that there there are so many it's so it is so hard to to help other people when you're fucking drowning yourself mm. as well. Yeah. There is that. And, but, and then there's also the bystander effect too, which is super fucking powerful mm. in, in and of itself where it's, which is, which is why I talk about making the, the active decision to be a good man mm. because bystander effect is so fucking powerful so yeah, yeah. where they, they, I mean, they've done experiments to prove it where they've had people in a, in a doctor's office waiting for their appointment and they've had one person who doesn't know their part of an experiment everyone else is an actor they'll put smoke coming out of a door and if everyone leaves the room the guy that doesn't know they're part of the experiment will but if everyone else acts super normal six other people there's an obvious fire in the room that person who who is not an actor surrounded by actors who are acting calm will sit there and be like well no one else is panicking i guess i won't leave the room oh, and in real life that guy burns to death because he doesn't want to look weird oh man How's this? A couple months ago, I was on the bus going to Launceston to do a grill talk show, and this fellow on the bus projectile vomited everywhere. Yeah. And the whole bus stunk out with the worst Parmesan cheese smell of spew. <laughs> it was fucking horrible. And everyone, yeah. out of fear of standing out, yeah. was saying nothing. Everyone yeah. just said, dying. Yeah. Like, <laughs> trying not to throw up as well. I looked around, I was like, well, obviously, I have to practice my yeah. authority in this situation. Yeah. Driver, blah, 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 let's pull over up here, blah, 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 blah. Everyone's yeah. just looking at me like, thank you. And yeah. I looked at them like, would you rather suffer in the depths of the essence of this guy's yeah. vomit until you fucking vomit all that and the chain reaction takes over the whole bus yeah. rather than just standing out and going, hey, driver, someone's thrown up, we need to pull over. I think it's, it's, a, like, it's a, often in public, it's it's just a freeze response. Yeah, like people aren't deciding not to do anything, and they're not de- and they're not deciding to do something either. They're just stuck in between, and and the effect is nothing is done. Bless them. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's like like I remember I, it's something that I'll prob- that I will probably talk about later. But so, anyway, mm. something fucking horrible happened to someone that I loved, and I was very like overwhelmed with the world is cruel the world is fucked i don't know how to respond to this mm. uh and eventually i got i got to well the 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 um the this great quote in like this um uh, i i had been years uh, about a year earlier i'd been reading a lot of stoic philosophy and one mm. of my favorite quotes was the best revenge is to not be like that. Mm. And I was like, mm. well, how? what is the opposite of this thing? Mm. And the opposite of this is to be a good man because if there was a good man in that situation, this horrible thing would not have happened. Yeah, and I'm I'm writing because I write in my journal, I'm writing about this, I'm like, I'm going to respond and I will, I'm going to be a good man mm. uh, and that's how I'm going to respond to this. Mm. Uh, and then like on the way home, from where I was riding, literally it's a five to seven minute walk. We just did it today. It's like mm. five minutes. There's this young man off his head on, I don't even know what, some kind of drug. He's wa- wandering up and down the street going, bashing into front fences, like drooling, freaking out. I'm with the dog. And maybe a year ago I would go, I'm sick. I got my own bullshit, mm. whatever. I'm going home. But in this scenario, I was like, I'm, I've just written down, I'm going to be a good man. And God goes, fucking prove it. Yeah. And then I puts me in the path of this young man. People are leaving their house, watching him. No one's doing anything. Mm. And then I put the dog away. And then I just start following him down the street. And uh, I, you know, I call uh, an ambulance for the guy. And I'm following him down the street because he doesn't even know where the fuck he's going. I'm keeping a very safe distance because that's a really, really, really important thing is if you intervene in these types of things, you must be safe. Yeah. This is not something I would ever recommend for women to do ever. This, mm. is, a, this is a man's job. 
Um, and even when you are a man, I'm, I'm, I'm huge. I'm six foot eight. I'm a very dangerous person. I'm always looking at situations like yeah, this. You have to put your safety first. And I've put myself in some very dangerous situations, but the more I close, and this is like with God as well. Like when you say a good man, you take out the O, then it's God man. You know what I mean? A good man is a man that walks with God. Mm. And that's where God will put you in these positions. But you got to also remember God is about putting yourself first. In a, in, a, you, in a safe yeah. way, you have to be mindful of that. Yes, you know? yes, because these things can be fucking dangerous know, for sure. It can be very dangerous. Um, <clears throat> and I'm following this guy, and then i following him for a little bit. He turns around, and then I notice this car does a U-turn, and I see this woman in the car following him as well. Mm. And uh, she's just driving behind him slowly, and I... I you know, walk up to her window. I'm like, I'm like, is this your son? Mm. And she goes, no, but I have sons. And she's like, no one's helping him. And she starts crying. And because she sees Bless. what I see, which is a whole street of just people looking at this dude who needs help. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just go, I'm help. I'm here. I'm helping. Mm. And then I'm like, can I get in your car? Cause now I'm fucking worried about this woman. And then I'm thinking, shit, now, she probably shouldn't even let me in her car either because who am I? Mm. So I go, I live in this house. This is my name. I just put my dog in. There's my dog. That's where I live. Can I stay with you while we follow this guy? Mm. And uh, I end up walking with her. I ended up having to get out of the car and I helped this dude get home. He was trying to walk home. He, what happened was he was on a building site with these laborers who gave him drugs. He didn't know what it was. He took way too much. And then they fucked off and abandoned him because they were worried about getting in trouble. Um, shit in, men. In fact, they, Bunch were, of shit men. they were following this woman um, to see if she would call the cops or whatever. And what? then they followed her the whole time. The so, tradies. Yeah. Yeah. Shit men. Yeah. The so, worst men. Yes. Yeah. So Trash. Then, Shame. So then we call then we call the cops and this guy gets home and I make sure he gets into his house. We stress to the police he's not dangerous, he's just off his head. He gets the help that he needs. This woman gets to go home safe and I go home and I had a big cry. Mm. And that's like that's it's a blessing, when, bro. Yeah, that's it, it is and that's like, oh man, I actually really helped. I was safe. I made sure that it didn't it wasn't going to harm me. I didn't go in to completely fix this man's life. Mm. You know, I got him home safe. I got him access to res to some resources. I gave a statement to the cops about these other people and this woman didn't have to do that by herself because mm. that could have been potentially dangerous for her. I got to be a good man. I went home. I had a big cry and I was like, that's that's what it is. It's a blessing, it's, man. You, when, you have a, when you're presented with an opportunity to do good, when it's safe to do so, you must. Oh, yeah. Because there are so many men out there that, that cause these this harm and commit these these uh, these horrible acts. And if good men were around or if good men influenced those men who harm when they were younger, they maybe never would have gotten to a position mm. where they were harming. Yeah, we have to learn how to transfer our energy. Mm. This is a hard thing when we go through domestic violence, all these things that people go through when they're young and then they they replicate this behaviour, these learned mm. behaviours, you know. We have to figure out how ways that we can transfer the energy and not carry it ourselves. All the times that I was violent and I was a bad man, I was a shit man, was because I wasn't taking accountability for the energy I was carrying and finding healthier outlets to, to process mm. it. You know, and that negative charge, like even bare feet on the ground, can be a thing that takes that negative charge out. I think back to the years when I was angry. I never put my bare feet on the ground. I just carried this negative charge until mm. it came out in my fists. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, it's so easy to understand once you you do that journey and continue to do it, man. Like God's God's so blessed, man. Like I, yeah, I had a fan, a big supporter of my music that committed suicide about four years ago and I was one of the last people to speak to him and try to talk him out of it. And then on Easter Saturday, while I was living in Melbourne, I, I prayed and I went for a walk and I ended up coming across a gang of kids in the, in the middle of a park in Coburg. And coincidentally, one of the kids was the son of this supporter of mine from Tasmania that committed suicide four years ago. Wow. And at that point, as soon as I this kid came over, he said, are you really? He said, you know my dad. As soon as he said his dad's name and it 
God was just like, this is your job. You have to be a good man. You know what I mean? And so I just sat down with the it's young fellow. It's a decision fella, that you make. Yeah, yeah. Because you could have gone, yeah, I am, mate. Thanks. Nice to meet you. See you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know. And that, for, and yeah, it, that like, wouldn't have been an evil act nah, to do. But, but you were pre time, you're presented with the opportunity to be a good man. Yeah. And I gave that young fella everything that I could just in regards to told him all the memories I had of his father, I, you know, talk to him about grief, talk to him about healing, talk to him about God, talk to him about he's 15, he's on the streets at the moment, he just joined a gang. Um, he's just going through it all, you know, yeah. and his dad's not around. Mm. And I was one of the last few people to speak to his dad, and his dad supported me, gave me a lot of good energy. And that's where, like, as soon as I, God showed me, like, I put you in this part, like the, the odds are impossible. Your voice would have been in, in this kid's house. 100%. Because of your music. listening to me, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, God put me in this place to, to be a good man and, and give that young fella everything I knew, you know, and to transfer some of the energy that I was still carrying from his dad. His dad had transferred good energy onto me. Dad was no longer around. I'm still carrying good energy from his dad, mm. so I had to give that good energy to him. Yeah. You know, and... um. And when I, when I walked out of that park, man, I cried. Not because I was sad, not because it was emotionally confronting, not because of that, because of the blessing. Yeah. The same, th the same reason you cried when you got home that day after, Yeah. you know, the situation with that fella in the street, man. And this is what we've got to keep doing. It's the only way that we can contribute to this world of so much pain and so much anger. Everyone's lying. Everyone's trying to be something they're not. You know, like I talk to these 16-year-old kids that, they're in the hip-hop scene and they're so refreshed that I just fucking talk so transparently with them because mm. all the other adults are lying to them. But yeah. the kids can see what's all happening on the internet. Yeah. They know what's going on. They're like, we're aware of the chaos, but you're all just pretending to be normal. Yeah. Just be honest. Yes. You know, and I think that's, that's really where it's at. The more that we can just break down these walls to be purely honest. God bless, man. Yeah. Mm. That's it. That's I think that's a probably a good good spot to end it. Yeah. What uh, a what a journey, man. I'm gonna what I think the main thing that I've said it a few times is I feel like not all the time, but you are in your life, you are presented with opportunities to make the good decision mm. and make the good act. And and you, I think the more present you are in right now mm. and aware of your surroundings you will start to notice opportunities to do small things. Yeah. Some of them are rarely they're huge things that you can do or they're small things that have giant impacts. Mm. Um, and the more present you are and, and also the more you have the agency and the knowledge that you actually can do good things mm. in real life spontaneously yeah. as the opportunity presents itself. I've oh, just been nice to the lady at the shop. 100%. You know, I, I saw this lovely lady in the shop down in Tassie before I left, and she's always so nice, and everyone ignores her. And I just went up to her and I went, hey, darling, I really appreciate how much good energy you put out there. And I know you don't always get back, but just yeah. know it's appreciated. She fully just froze up and started to cry, bless her, because she's like, no one's ever said anything like that it's, to me. It's something it that I've started doing. Yeah, 10 seconds out of my day yeah. to make a fucking world of difference in someone's life. and. I've worked behind the, I've been, a, you know, behind yeah. cash register. People are rude. Yeah. Be a good person. Do good shit. Give love to the world. Find God. God is that unconditional love that even when shit is fucking terrible. Like I was in prison getting strip searched, still being kind to the cunts that are looking in my ass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Fucking why not? Well, you'd want to be. Yeah, you'd want to be. <laughs> no, but, like, but why not? Like, why not yeah, throw why that not? fucking spanner in the works? Yeah. You know, people don't know. Like, this is where, like... Don't fart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, like, cops. Like, I see cops in the street. Yeah. And, man, like, two days after the Spaniard vlog, I'm walking through the Hobart Mall, 12 cops walk by and they go, Grills? I was yeah. like, what the fuck? You guys were just searching through my Instagram two days ago, you bunch of weirdos. Because like, I yeah. see them at Christmas. So yeah. I go... Merry Christmas, officers. They go, oh, you what? Yeah. I said, Merry Christmas. So, oh, okay. <laughs> and then they yeah. just drive off though. Like, hmm. I'm and, sorry. Yeah. Like, Who knows the... You've got and, no social skills. This yeah. is the thing. If you're going to become a cop or a yeah. police officer, learn how to socialise. <laughs> Don't learn how to use a gun. Learn yeah. how to socialise. Learn how to use your heart and your mind yeah. to survive. 
I've travelled the country. I've been. I've worked in the fucking worst detention centres. I've been to every fucking hood in this country. Been around. Never needed a gun. Never needed a knife. Yeah. Because I have my mind and I have my heart and I know how to talk. Yeah. So that's what you just need to do. Just learn how to actually fucking communicate with the world around you through this frequency, not through this frequency of oh, control. You've got me vest on. I've got all my little gadgets to fucking make yourself look scary enough to pretend I'm not scared. Because. Fuck, I just see fear in their eyes. Like, unfortunately, all those fucking loony little hippies are right. <laughs> and unfortunately, the answer is love. It is. <laughs> all of this bullshit. It is, yeah, yeah. Uh, when when often the natural reaction is just hate and yeah. uh, and uh, anger. Yeah. And often that's that's the, an, an unavoidable reaction when things happen in the moment. Oh, yeah. But you have to take it apart and, and process it and be like, you know what, maybe this wouldn't have happened if everyone was a little bit fucking nicer. And that's the difference <laughs> between reacting and responding. Yeah. It's when you react, it's the first instinct. Yeah. That's your trauma. And you can your feel all of those things. Yeah, you just reactions. don't have to act on them. Well, that's it. Reactions come from trauma. Yeah. React. It's that kind of hard setting. It's our frontal lobe mm. that helps us respond. So instead of moving with this, that reaction, yeah. think with this, respond. It's the answers. All right. That's it. I love you guys. Love you, Lewis. Yeah, love you too, buddy. Fucking yeah. Uh, yeah, 2024, let's go. We've leveled up. Yeah. God's in, who would have thought a few years ago me and Lewis would be here <laughs> talking about God? Go and on, we've love. gone through some hard fucking years of atheists. Uh, you know, we've gone through it all. Yeah. And here we are. The answer is we're not trying to be religious. We're not trying to fucking, not trying to do nothing. We're trying to love ourselves and give love to the world in the best way that we can. And I'm so grateful for our unconditional love of friendship, bro. Because God too. has been in our friendship the whole time. Yes. Through all the ups and downs. Alhamdulillah, my yeah, brother. That's him, my brother. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a shit one. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all right. Have a shit one at the end. Like. <laughs>